1971, uh, a number of things took place that brought quite a bit of change into my life. I had been working that summer in the Lerner Marine Laboratory on the island of Bimini. And one afternoon, having come in from my sampling and research work, I found my laboratory filled with Frenchmen. And it turned out to be the crew of the Calypso who were working on the Blue Holes of the Bahamas film. Uh, they had two scientists with them uh, as advisors for this film, uh, Eugene Shin and Bob Dill, two sedimentologists, who were friends of my professor, Dr. Hay. And they invited me out to the Calypso to go diving with them and show them around a bit. Well, after the first dive, they actually asked if I could join them for a few days, which at the age of 22 to get asked to dive with Jacques Cousteau for a few days is just about as huge as anything gets. So that was one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had. At the same time, I got a phone call from uh, uh, my professor uh, saying that he had a scholarship from the American National Science Foundation for me to go to Switzerland for a year. And this, of course, was another wonderful opportunity. I had been finishing up my degree in physics at the University of Illinois. And uh, along with mechanical and electrical physics, I was involved in acoustic physics. Uh, and having completed that was concentrating more on the geology side. The physics thing will become important as we move forward, talking about how this affects guitar building. So I went to Switzerland for a year, uh, spent a lot of time in the mountains, managed to learn uh, both German and Swiss dialect, and came back at the end of that year just to finish things up at the University of Illinois before starting my master's degree. That summer, that entire fall, was a big time in music, spending a lot of time in the bands, a lot of time working on guitars, building instruments, and in general having a wonderful time trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. A question that I am still trying to answer. In May 1973, I got a phone call from Professor Holtinger at the University of Basel uh, saying that he had a scholarship and research project from the Swiss National Science Foundation and asked if I'd come back and finish up my master's degree at the University of Basel and then work on these projects. They were exciting projects. Uh, they were going to be um, mapping and environmental studies in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, including uh, the island of uh, Mallorca, uh, Isola Delba off of Italy, and the island of Crete. The only catch was I had to be there within two weeks. So I dropped everything at the University of Illinois. I had all of the credits I needed for my physics degree. Took a flight back to Switzerland and started the next part of my life, which was to go on to involve a number of very exciting projects in science, a lot of very creative thought, and also have a chance to uh, build a solo music career in Switzerland, playing what was known as the small theater circuit. But let's stay with science for a moment now. The, the projects that we were working on were, were extremely creative. They were going out and taking a look at marine environments and trying to determine the the ecological factors that affected where and how the animals would live, and also how the well, morphology of the animals, if I say morphology, you think, think hand, that's a morphological factor, or you could think foot, that's a morphological factor, or fin on a fish, but how these morphological factors could show you what the environment really looked like. So you had to go out and have a completely open mind and take a look and say, what am I going to see? Here's the information I have. Here's what I know. And how can I take all of this new information 
and synthesize a new solution. And this is, for me, the secret of learning and knowing how to use the information that you have. Fascinating times, and I loved every minute of it. Well, I did have a scholarship in Basel, but again, we come back to augmenting my income. Uh, the scholarship didn't involve anything that would cover cost of living. So I went around to the companies that were importing guitars and became the authorized workshop for Martin, Fender, Gibson, Rickenbacker, and several other companies doing repair work in either a part of my apartment or their basements or a farmhouse. And that managed to help me pay for my rent as well as my food, both of which were a lot nicer than sleeping on the streets and playing guitar on the street corner. And uh, during this time period, I also had a chance uh, to play this small theater circuit that I mentioned before and went on two tours a year playing about 20 nights on each of the tours, having a lot of fun, and uh, developing what I like to call musical uh, cabaret. Because if you're alone on stage, you've got to find some way of entertaining the public besides just sitting there and singing them one song after the other. Well, in 1976, I had completed my studies. I had my master's degree. And the next question was going to be, what do I do now? I had a scholarship to work in the Red Sea, and I was doing repair work for all of these various companies. And I made a decision that after 10 years of research work, I wanted to take a year off and just concentrate on guitars, repairs, building, thoughts. And so I decided to take this year off. At the same time, in February 77, uh, I got married to a wonderful Swiss woman. Uh, and uh, we were actually planning to come back to the States. That sort of changed very quickly to, to a series of, of uh, factors that came up and decided to start the shop in Switzerland. As I said, that was going to be for one year and that is now 39 years ago. So it turned out to be a very long year. The guitar shop was called Guitars by Levinson, trying to give it a little bit of class. And uh, we started out just doing, we, I started out just doing repair work. And within about six months, I had uh, the one bedroom that I had turned into my repair shop the living room had had to be given up, and it was a small retail shop and was piled to the ceiling with repairs waiting to get done. The kitchen had been turned into a packing room. We still managed to keep the rear bedroom to have some place to have our clothes and lay down in the evening. And from there on, I started teaching people how to build guitars, how to do guitar repairs. And within about two years, Guitars by Levinson had uh, five other people working in the workshop there. Obviously, by this time, we had to move out into larger premises uh, and uh, became, to my knowledge, the largest repair shop anywhere in Europe at that time. Now, one of the most important things that took place in this period is that we had musicians coming from the north of Sweden or from the south of Italy or from what was uh, Serbo-Croatia uh, who were either on tour with bands or had heard about us who came to the shop and spent their time telling us what it was they didn't like about their guitar what it is that they wished that their guitar would do, and if we could help them achieve that. What a marketing study. Day in and day out, actual musicians sat there and told you, this is what I want. 
And not only that, when you completed the work for them, you could give the instrument back to them and they would either say, uh, it's not quite what I wanted, or finally, this is exactly what I've always wanted my instrument to do. And through all of these basically day-to-day -day marketing studies, you got much more insight into what it was that guitarists or bassists really were looking for in their instruments, where that they felt it was lacking, and how you could help them achieve their goals. During this time period, I really, in discussions with musicians, they would ask me, you know, as a guitar builder, what are your thoughts about this? And, and uh, do you think that this finish looks better than another finish? And during this period is when I came to the realization that as a guitar builder or a repairman, uh, what you were doing, you were a tool maker. You made tools for musicians. And if you made the best tool possible for the musician, you made his life and his music better. You come to the realization that as music is happening in your head, and you want to have that music come out, whether that be come out of the sound hole of your acoustic guitar or come out of the speaker for your electric guitar. The creativity that the musician has is let loose, unhampered the best, if there is no, nothing that disturbs him between here and what comes out of the speaker. The less he notices that he actually has a guitar in his hands, the less he has to feel about playing that instrument, the better he, can, he will play and the more creative he will be. Those creative juices that he has flowing will not be hampered by anything. And this became then the goal of everything that we were doing in the workshop.